Dr. Lori Lady Welcome to the monthly clinical meeting of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. This is for the month of May. Um, and today it is in collaboration with the Sri Lanka College of Dermatologists. Today's monthly clinical meeting will be an overview of paraneoplastic cutaneous manifestations. And we have four speakers uh, for today's meeting. Uh, Dr. Dolini Yanagamu, consultant dermatologist, National Hospital Candy. Dr. Chiranjay Ekanayaka, senior registrar in dermatology, National Hospital Candy. Dr. Nitya Gunavardana, senior registrar in dermatology, National Hospital Candy. And Dr. Sachitra Samarapur, registrar in dermatology from the National Hospital Candy. Um, thank you all for joining online and uh, in person at the Senate Council Room. Uh, Without further delay, we will start today's meeting. And um, first will be a, a case presentation. And this will be conducted by Dr. Nitya Gunavardana, Senior Registrar in Dermatology from the National Hospital, Kandy. Thank you, Dr. Hyman, for the kind introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Nitya Gunavadana, Senior Registrar in Dermatology from National Hospital, Kandy. I would like to thank Sri Lanka Medical Association for giving us this opportunity. So moving on to the case presentation, our patient is a 54-year-old mother of three with a history of hypertension and dyslipidemia, and she was diagnosed with ovarian carcinoma one year ago and underwent PH and VSO, transabdominal hysterectomy and oophorectomy. And currently, she is on chemotherapy. And by the time she presented to us, the fourth cycle of chemotherapy was completed. When she presented to us, there was facial swelling, mainly involving periorbital regions, region for three days. And also, there was a mild erythematous rash of uh, upper chest and back, and she complained that it was mildly itchy, and there was difficulty and pain when raising her arms, and difficulty getting up from squatting position, suggestive of proximal myopathy for about one week duration. Also, uh, she complained of difficulty in swallowing, but she denied shortness of breath, difficulty in speech, and uh, there were few uh, constitutional symptoms like malaise, loss of appetite and loss of weight, but she did not have pain. There were no oral ulcers or inflammatory type joint pain, no port sensitive rash, or distinct of SAD, and there no joint deformities. There was no evidence of scleroderma, um, like uh, thickening of the skin or difficulty in opening the mouth. There were no dry eyes or dry mouth, and she denied the white basic, tri basic color change of, change of fingers or toes, following cold exposure, suggestive of Reynolds in Ogden. And uh, when we were looking for any cause uh, suggestive of the myopathy, there were no features to suggest hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism. There was uh, no diarrhea causing any uh, metabolic derangement. And uh, she was not on long-term steroids or statins. Regarding her past medical history, hypertension and dyslipidemia was diagnosed three years ago and she had moderate depression. Uh, as I mentioned before, she underwent THBSO and was awaiting abdominal surgery for lymph node dissection in two, three weeks time. She was on routine antihypertensives and antidepressants. Uh, there was a family history suggestive of uh, connective tissue disease in a positive family member. She's a mother of three and all her children are pursuing higher education. And she was quite worried about the disruption of studies of the youngest child as she had to attend mother's needs uh, at the hospital. So moving on to the examination, she was not pale nor ecteric. There were no enlarged lymph nodes. And as you can see, 
she had patience with him and made periodical uh, edema with the erythematous hue and also there was an erythematous blotchy rash mainly in the upper anterior part of the trunk and upper posterior part of the trunk. And when we thoroughly examined the patient, we noted rather cuticles, but there was uh, no evidence of any digital ulcers or pitted scars. And uh, periangual lymphoma could not be noticed mainly, think, mainly because of the skin tone. And when we did the nail pole capillaroscopy, they are enlarged or dilated nail pole capillaries. So with the given history and the examination so far, features were in keeping with dermatomyositis. So we uh, looked for the other cutaneous uh, manifestations of dermatomyositis like Gottram's sign, Gottram's capillaries, but they were uh, not there. There were no evidence of uh, other cutaneous manifestations of the connective tissue diseases like uh, male rash or speckled leukoderma or, or sclerodet. So uh, moving on to the system examination, there was an obvious proximal myopathy. Power was four out of five, mainly in the proximal muscle groups than the distal muscle groups. And there was no sensory impairment. Reflexes were also normal. We specifically looked for uh, bibasal palpitations because dermatomyositis can be associated with interstitial lung disease, but the respiratory examination was normal. Uh, other uh, systems, CVS and abdominal examination were unremarkable. So, uh, with these symptoms and signs, dermatomyositis was our first differential diagnosis, and there was no clinical evidence of antisynthetic syndrome. In antisynthetic syndrome, there should be evidence of interstitial lung disease, polyarthritis, renal phenomenon which is which was absent in this patient. However, since the patient had undergone chemotherapy, we thought of uh, chemotherapy induced drug reactions like toxic erythema of chemotherapy, but uh, mainly in toxic erythema of chemotherapy, erythema is confined to the apron sites, palms and soles and flexural areas. So it was uh, underlying. Mm -hmm. And according to that, uh, we Planned out the investigations. The muscle and signs were high. CPK was uh, markedly elevated. The ST levels were high. Inflammatory markers were also towards the higher side. And uh, EMT was suggestive of a myopathy with low amplitude, polyphase or duration, motor with morphology noted with early recruitment pattern, which confirmed a myopathy. So uh, there are certain autoantibodies done to confirm the diagnosis of dermatomyositis. We wanted to do myositis-specific autoantibody, MI2, but unfortunately, we did not have the facility to do that. And then here I want to mention that we have usually heard about anti one and MI2, but recently, a new antibody panel has been introduced uh, in the diagnostic, diagnostics of dermatomyositis, and these are the myositis-specific Autoantibodies, and these are the antisynthetic syndrome specific autoantibodies. And there are certain antibodies that show a high risk for associations of dermatomyositis, such as MDA5. If the levels of MDA5 uh, are high, then the patient has a high chance of uh, getting IL, interstitial lung disease, and anti tip one and NXP2 is associated with increased risk of malignancy in these patients. So in the past, many diagnosis, diagnostic criteria have been introduced for uh, dermatomyositis. Mohan and Peter classification is the first one, which was uh, introduced in 1975. And uh, our patient had almost all these features. And the most recent one is the EULA ACR classification, which was introduced in 2017. So to sum up the initial workup of suspected dermatomyositis, uh, we should take a history and physical examination and uh, do the muscle lens signs like creatine primers, LDH, AST, and algolis, and the auto uh, antibody panel, as I mentioned before. And if the above tests are equivocal or if the diagnosis remains uncertain, then MRI plays a role. T2 weighted MRI can be done in the areas of weakness and also MRI uh, guided muscle biopsy. Uh, would play a significant role. So uh, regarding the treatment of this patient, we had a multidisciplinary approach. 
we liaised with the uh, oncosurgeons as well as the anesthetists at the patient for surveying para uh, aortic lymph node dissection. Uh, and uh, we thought that uh, it's good to withhold the surgery till the patient is in full remission because patient had to undergo general anesthesia and there is a high risk of respiratory paralysis. So we started the patient with tropical steroids, mild to moderate potent steroids, and we advised uh, her regarding the importance of water protection and prescribed sunblocks and uh, prescribed oral prednisolone, HCP1 and MMA. But the patient complained of difficulty in swallowing and she said that it took her few hours to take all the pills. So we thought of proceeding with IVIG, two grams per kilogram body weight for three days and uh, routine antihypertensives and antidepressants were given. And uh, within one week of this treatment, the patient had a significant improvement. And uh, before uh, wrapping up my case presentation, I thought of giving a brief overview of the cutaneous manifestations of dermatomyositis. Hemiotrophrash is, as I mentioned before, is periorbital swelling with an erythematous hue. And this is V sign and shawl sign. Uh, in our patient also, there was the same signs with an erythematous erythema. And also got trans papules, that is uh, uh, erythematous to violation, scaly papules, mainly in the Intercarpophalangeal and metacarpophalangeal joint. Gottron sign is an ectomatous patch. There can be a scale to it, uh, mainly uh, in the extensors, knee joints and uh, elbow joints. And there can be rabbit cuticles, nail fold infarcts, nail fold telangiectasia, periangual erythema. And this is the Hall's design. This is poikiloderm uh, involving the lateral aspect of the thigh and uh, calcinosis cutis, calcium deposits uh, in the skin. And flagellate erythema is another feature. And uh, if there is hyperkeratosis with uh, scaling involving the lateral aspects of the fingers, that is suggestive of mechanics hand. And also, they can have Raynaud's phenomenon, panniculitis. And uh, dermatomyositis is involved with malignancy. The estimated prevalence is 20%. And uh, the risk of malignancy is usually high within the first five years of making the diagnosis of dermatomyositis. However, dermatomyositis can occur before, concurrently, and following malignancy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mita. Um, so, our next speaker today is Dr. Ranjay Ekanayaka, Senior Registrar in Dermatology from the National Hospital of um, And um, unfortunately, due to transport difficulties, uh, we have only have our speakers uh, on uh, Zoom. Uh, but thank you very much. Uh, and uh, just uh, so that uh, the speakers also are aware, we have uh, an audience uh, in the council room uh, at SLMA too. Um, so, and we have uh, 34 participants online. Um, over to you, Dr. Chiranjaya, for the talk. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Honorable Presidents uh, and the team of SLMA for giving this wonderful opportunity to dermatogenic uh, candy. Uh, so directly, I move to the topic that is uh, the blisters in adults, a window to hidden diagnosis. So, yeah. Uh, this is regarding a male patient who is in uh, around 82 years of age and he was not a diagnosed patient with any chronic disorder and uh, he presented to us with uh, exertional dyspnea with the generalized fatigue and uh, bilateral lower limb swelling and loss of weight around 5 kilogram loss was there for last two months duration and also there was no uh, dyspnea and presto his appetite also remained low. At that time, he noticed that multiple blisters 
appeared around uh, he mainly uh, initially around his uh, knee joints, elbow joints, and buttocks areas for last two months duration. Uh, regarding that, uh, he he described those things uh, like that. Uh, those uh, blisters, uh, most of them remain. Uh, some of them ruptured spontaneously uh, with uh, discharging clear fluid, but most of the blisters remain unchanged. Uh, they were itchy but not painful. There's no excess with the sun exposure and also uh, the, mostly predilection to the extremities of the limbs and uh, no such blister involvement in oral or genital mucosa. Uh, he sought medical opinion from a general practitioner where he was told that uh, the skin lesions were due to some skin infection and uh, treated with oral and topical antibiotic for nearly one week duration but he didn't achieve any improvement with that antibiotics. After two weeks, uh, he had noticed few painless uh, lumps appeared in his neck, axilla, groin, and uh, the size of the lumps remained the same over uh, uh, that two weeks, uh, that whole duration. And the patient was admitted to the medical ward for the further evaluation. Uh, no history of fever at there that uh, thoroughly uh, evaluation was done at the medical ward. Uh, in that they've uh, noticed those things that no history of fever, gum bleeding, or recurrent sinopulmonary infections, and also no contact history of tuberculosis, uh, and also the, there's no history uh, suggestive of chronic lung diseases or any hemoptysis, uh, no evidence of uh, high-risk behavior, and also there's no yellowish discoloration of eyes, abdominal pain, altered bowel habits, or any other gastrointestinal symptoms. Uh, and also not noted any uh, hair loss, joint pain, hematuria, proteuri, uh, or any history suggestive of any renal disorder. And uh, he was not giving any history of previous anemia and his family history was negative for significant illnesses. And also he was clinically eutyroid as well. Uh, he was a non-vegetarian and uh, farmer by occupation. On examination, uh, he was cachectic. Uh, for last two month duration, he, he complained those symptoms. And on the examination, we found uh, that he was severely cachectic and BMI was around 80. Uh, and uh, he was afebrile, uh, moderately pale, but not pictoric as well. Uh, there was no evidence of uh, angular stomatitis, glossitis, so oral and genital ulcerations. Uh, and there were no detectable photo distributed skin lesions as well. Uh, when regarding that uh, descriptive examination finding of his uh, dermatological condition, he had multiple different size tens, non tender bullet with varying sizes, which filled with serous fluid, but no pustules so or pus discharge. Uh, bullet were mainly distributed over frontal region and proximal limbs and around knee as well as elbow joints. Uh, and a few uh, urticated lesions also noted and also some uh, ruptured blisters also noted. Uh, there were no any surrounding milia formation, no scarring and blisters not arranged in a rosette-like appearance and some ruptured blisters were noted over the bilateral lower limbs as well. So this is the basically the appearance of uh, his skin findings, skin lesions, uh, when he was admitted to the medical board. So you can appreciate some uh, tense blisters are there with different varying sizes. And mostly in here, this picture, we can't appreciate that uh, associated urtic area. And uh, it is obvious some blisters has ruptured, but most of them remaining intact. Uh, apart from that, he had uh, had a bilateral pitting ankle edema up to the mid calf level, and he had generalized lymphadenopathy in cervical, axillary, inguinal, and uh, epitrochlear uh, regions, which were painless, firm, and rubbery. He had a splenomegaly, which was five centimeters uh, below the left costal margin, and the liver was uh, not palpable. Other systemic examination was unremarkable. So with that uh, history and examination, 
we came into the diagnosis that we, uh, with the history he is giving that uh, two month dur uh, that during that last two month duration he had uh, loss of his weight and he felt uh, fatigability and on examination he was severely cachectic. Apart from that, there are skin lesions as well as some painless lump. I mean, lymph node and lymphadenopathy was there. Based on the history and examination, we thought of underlying hematological malignancy is the most possible probable diagnosis. So, what was the dermatological condition here? So, is it associated with that uh, disease or whether it uh, separately appeared? It, it's a se separate entity that we have to think about that. So, based on the history and examination, we came into the diagnosis of bullous pemphigoid. So I would like to mention here from the history, uh, we have to think of many important things, consider many important, uh, several important points uh, to come into the diagnosis of bullous pemphigoid. He's an elderly male, elderly patient. This is one point. And he's uh, complaining of itching and mainly the distance are tense, not easily rupturing. And also uh, the lesions distributed mainly over the frontal areas, not in the apical distal areas. With that, uh, what coming to the examination, we found that, uh, as I previously mentioned, these are tense blisters that they are and associated urticated lesions also noted. Uh, and uh, the distribution also that mainly uh, involved in the frontal region. So let's move on to the investi um, uh, important investigation findings here. His blood picture revealed uh, nomochromic normocytic uh, red cells with moderate leukocytosis with 80% of the small mature lymphocytes with uh, smudge cells. And ultrasound scan uh, revealed moderate splenomegaly with paraiotic lymphadenopathy. The mode marrow aspiration revealed evidence of lymphoproliferative disorder. 75% of uh, marrow nucleated cells were small mature lymphocytes and the refined biopsy showed nodular interstitial infiltration of the uh, no, uh, uh, monomorphic small mature lymphocytes and flow centometry also uh, abnormal and uh, CCT uh, we did then chest abdomen and pelvis confirmed paraiotic lymphadenopathy and spinomegaly and cytogenetic and uh, IgHB gene mutation analysis were done due to uh, we didn't do that due to that unaffordability. Uh, beta 2 microglobulin levels were within the normal range. The, we did the skin uh, biopsy from the uh, margin of the lesion and uh, histopathological evaluation report that came as uh, the sub epidermal split filled with predominantly eosinophils and minimal lymphocyte infiltration of. The dermis was also seen, but no uh, mucin deposition is not uh, there. So basically, it is compatible with bullous pemphigoid diagnosis. So the management wise, that patient was transfused, the packed red cells to correct symptomat uh, symptomatic anemia and high dose of prednisolone is started. Skin lesions didn't show uh, much improvement with steroid therapy at the initial stage, but uh, since after uh, five six days that there was a significant improvement uh, seen, uh, since anemia in person uh, despite transfusion support and uh, with the presence of paraneoplast uh, sorry the, uh, that pemphigoid features patient was uh, started on uh, bendamustine and rituximab based chemotherapy according to hematology team's op opinion actually that uh, rituximab basically we started due to that uh, his uh, that ongoing hematological malignancy at the initial stage that if uh, uh, though he didn't have show any uh, good response to oral steroids therapy but uh, later on he showed that good remarkable response to steroids but anyway that uh, we started rituximab that other uh, drug uh, because of uh, that uh, internal malignancy so uh, so one in two important points i would like to highlight here that uh, from a uh, blistering disorders in adults that basically pemphigus vulgaris and bullous pemphigoid can be uh, can be associated with internal malignancies uh, when it is come to that pemphigus vulgaris that paraneoplastic pemphigus is the one uh, we have to think of uh, in associated with internal malignancies and also 
in paraneoplastic pain figures, I would like to tell a small uh, description about that because that the lesions are more uh, the, the parulent lesions which involve that uh, mucosal region and which are crossing the Bermudian border is the characteristic pitching uh, paraneoplastic pain figures. Uh, and also there are uh, tense blisters as well as flaxid blisters as well in paraneoplastic pain figures. Pain figures. In bullous pain figoid, uh, we can't actually differentiate from that uh, primary bullous pain figoid from paraneoplastic pain figures clinically. So here I have noted down some the conditions uh, which, uh, which shows that blistering in adults so bullous pemphigoid, pemphigus vulgaris, dermatitis herpetiformis, herbis soster, contact dermatitis, epidermolysis bullosa, porphyria cutanea tarda, so on. So, uh, so different diagnosis that we have to consider uh, when you see a blistering disorder in adults, but uh, we have to keep in mind uh, there could be some association with internal malignancies among those blisters. So, especially in bullous pemphigoid and pemphigus, we have to think of when you, uh, when the patient is show, showing other uh, features of internal malignancy. That's it. Thank you very much. I believe the next speaker is uh, Dr. Dulini Yenagam. Uh, yes, uh, so she's the consultant dermatologist at the National Hospital Family. Um, thank you, Madam, and uh, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, so uh, today we talked about paraneoplastic skin manifestations. So today now I'm going to give an overview of paraneoplastic skin manifestations. So first, let's see what is a paraneoplastic dermatosis. So to call a paraneoplastic disease, it may be defined as a hormonal neurological or dermatological disturbances and as clinical and biochemical imbalances associated with the uh, presenting can you just this please? Okay. Yes. Thanks. So the about what is paraneoplastic dermatosis? Paraneoplastic diseases may be defined as a hormonal, neurological, hematological disturbances, and as clinical and biochemical imbalances associated with the presence of malignancies without direct association with primary tumor invasion or metastasis. That is something to emphasize. There's no direct association with the primary tumor invasion or metastasis. They are not meds. So this is caused by a variety of factors. It could be inflammatory, proliferative, or metabolic factors. It could be related to the neoplasia, the, the factors related to neoplasia, such as polypeptides, hormones, cytokines, antibodies, or growth factors. Uh, they act as mediators and cause the paraneoplastic manifestation. So skin is the second most common paraneoplastic uh, involvement. Uh, second, it is only second to the endocrine uh, paraneoplastic uh, diseases. So skin plays a good role in paraneoplastic uh, manifestations. 
So the, as I mentioned, no presence of neoplastic cells in the skin. And this involvement is considered as a dermatological paraneoplastic syndrome. So there is some manifestations, but they are not the direct manifestation, primary tumor omits, no presence of neoplastic cells in the skin. So if you do a biopsy, you won't find the uh, metastatic disease or uh, the, uh, any other tumor findings in the skin uh, cells. So although these dermatoses are relatively unusual, but the recognition of some typical paraneoplastic dermatoses may lead to the early diagnosis of a neoplasm and determine a better prognosis. So uh, this, it says that there are up to 50 uh, diseases, paraneoplastic dermatoses. Uh, you can, I have just given an overview, uh, some of the common paraneoplastic dermatosis. You can see acanthosis, nigricans maligna, acquired pachydermatoglyphia. We are talking all about this. Erythema gyratum repens, basex, hypertrichosis, nunugosa, and necrolytic migratory erythema, lesser trellet, pain figures, uh, pitrasis, rotunda, dermatomyositis, palmoplantu keratoderma. So given the limited time and but the, this broad spectrum of diseases, but given the limited time, I'm just going to uh, talk about the dermatoses that are highly correlated with the malignancy whose recognition implies a mandatory investigation of internal malignancy. So if you see any of these things, you may, you must investigate for internal malignancy. There are dermatoses that have strong association with malignancies. There are some association, and it's some there are some dermatoses are rarely associated. But when we talk about these uh, dermatoses, that you should work out for the internal malignancy. We call them. There are strong association with the internal malignancy. So those are the uh, strong associated ones, which is acanthosis nigricans. Acquired pachydermatoglyphia, erythema gyratum repens, acrokeratosis paraneoplastica, uh, acquired hypertrichosis, necrolytic migratory erythema, lesser trellet sign. So, apart from that, dermatomyositis, uh, paraneoplastic para pemphigus, they also uh, count in this uh, spectrum. But as they were taught uh, by my uh, senior registrars, we will move on to these. So let's talk about acanthosis nigricans maligna. So you all know there are two varieties of acanthosis. One is benign, uh, uh, actually the, the other one is malignancy. When you talk, uh, see a dermatology textbook, there are seven varieties of acanthosis, but I'm, which I'm not going to talk about. So we'll stick into malignant and benign. So when you talk about, uh, so as you know, the malignant acanthosis nigricans also uh, always, uh, metabolic syndrome, uh, uh, diabetes, or insulin resistance, and sometimes it could be due to drugs. So those are the benign causes of acanthosis uh, nigricans. So when you talk about uh, malignancy-associated acanthosis nigricans, it is much less common, but you have to be uh, careful to pick it up. So when, it, uh, the, when you talk about the uh, clinical features, it begins with symmetrical hyperpigmentation in intertriginous areas such as axilla, cubital fossa, submammary, inguinal, and posterior cervical regions. You can see they are the places that we look for the acanthosis nigricans, uh, benign as well. But this in uh, like acanthosis nigricans maligna, especially any part of the body can be affected. And later what happens is lesions become very slightly infiltrated and velvety hyperkeratotic plaques. Com commonly, they are surrounded by acrocodons, some skin tags like lesions. So this acanthosis nigricans maligna can be associated with, can uh, coexist with lesser trellet sign and acanthosis palmaris, and I will tell you what they are. So you can see the typical distribution, but when talk about the malignant disease, they are extensive. Uh, they are very uh, rapidly progressing. So the commonest site of the underlying neoplasm is the gastrointestinal tract, uh, 70 to 90%, and mainly being the gastric adenocarcinoma is the most frequent one. So mainly GI tract and the gastric is the most frequent one. So associated uh, the malignancies, it can precede 
or occur simultaneously or occur after the diagnosis of cancer. So anytime they can proceed. It, it, they say that it can even uh, proceed before two to three years, four, five to six years before the cancer occurs. Uh, so the diagnosis of phacanthosis nigrigans maligna should be strongly considered in, especially if an adult over the 40 years of age uh, presents to you, and especially if it is very progressive, fast-growing skin lesions, and associated with weight loss. Not that everybody is having the weight loss, but if there's weight loss, you have to be very careful to the to diagnose whether it's a malignant acanthosis because the benign acanthosis they are uh, usually obese, they have the metabolic syndrome, but these acanthosis nigricans maligna they are usually tachectic patients associated with loss of appetite and loss of weight. So you have to be thinking of other endocrinological changes or genetically determined diseases if they are not there and the patient all of a sudden presenting with the progressive, fast growing, very extensive diseases, especially with weight loss and other CB symptoms and other uh, malignant features, then think of, of acanthosis nigricans um, maligna. In these individuals, um, an extensive gastrointestinal evaluation is mandatory. So if you think of AM, think of GI malignancy and evaluate for mandatory, uh, the gastrointestinal malignancy. So you can see the previous patient after the resection of the adenocarcinoma of the stomach, how he has responded with the disappearance of the skin lesions. So what is this? Acquired pachydermatoglyphia. So we call it tripe palms or acanthosis palmaris. Pachydermatoglyphia meaning that this describes the thickened skin of the palms. You can see the dermatoglyphic, uh, we call it dermatoglyphic, the skin creases, the small, small skin creases, they are enhanced, exaggerated. So this gives a velvety or less commonly it could be pitted or honeycomb pattern of the hands. So this resembles like intestinal velocities. So you can see the acquired pachydermatoglyphia, that is our dermatological word. You can call it tripe palms or acanthosis palmaris. So what are the associated malignancies? Neoplastic process have been reported in 90% of the uh, tripe palm. So if you see a tripe palm, be careful. So gastric and lung cancer account for the 50% of the tumors. So in the absence of association of acanthosis nigricans, lung cancer becomes more prevalent being found in more than 50%. No acanthosis, then the tripe palm more towards the uh, lung cancer. But the tripe palms alone, especially if the patient is male and also has clubbing, very strongly suggest an underlying lung cancer, while the tripe palms with acanthosis nigricans suggest you have an underlying gastric carcinoma. So see whether he has a gastric, uh, the acanthosis nigricans, then more towards gastric. Uh, if it is only tripe palms, more towards lung cancer. So other neoplasm solid organ tumors are uh, reported like breast and genitourinary tract cancer. So you can't just ignore, you have to evaluate for underlying malignancy. So what is lesotrelate sign? So lesotrelate sign is present as a sudden increase in the size of number of seborrheic keratosis. So if you see that, if you, if you come to a dermatologic clinic, we see a lot of keratosis, not in, uh, especially when you go to a broad and uh, white skin, if you observe uh, white skin and elderly patient, you can see, hundreds of seborrheic keratosis. So these are uh, papular, varicose, usually well-defined lesions, varying colors. Like in our skin, it's mainly dark, uh, the black, hyperpigmented, that primarily affect the thorax and dorsum, followed by the extremities, face, abdomen, neck, and axilla. So when uh, talking about the lesser trellet sign, what is important is they say that it's sudden appearance of the, the seborrheic keratosis. They are extensive and the pruritus and inflammation, uh, the frequent findings in the malignant, this, uh, the seborrheic keratosis. So approximately two thirds of patients have another paraneoplastic syndrome like acanthosis nigricans maligna. Uh, that is the most common one. And uh, look, you have to look for whether there's any other features uh, of the uh, in the patient. So it could be associated with acanthosis nigricans as well. So multiple seborrheic keratosis are extremely common, especially in elderly patients. More than our patients, it's in the elderly patients in a white skin, it's very common. So maybe pruritic or rapidly erupting without any apparent cause. And there'll be other causes like HIV, acromegaly, and resolving phase of the skin diseases, especially erythrodermic dermatosis, they also can uh, get multiple seborrheic dermatosis. So being this, the, given the common uh, presentation of the seborrheic keratosis, 
ketosis, you have to be very careful uh, to diagnose um, uh, lesser trellet sign. You call it lesser trellet sign as a sudden appearance of seborrheic ketosis uh, with an underlying malignancy. So associated malignancies, approximately half of all cancers associated with adenocarcinomas present in the GI tract, that gastric carcinoma is the most common, followed by the colon and rectal cancer. There are other lymphoproliferative paleoplasias and other solid organ tumors all associated. So uh, this is very common in um, we, uh, in the medical field. So erythema gyroid and repens. I know that you all study this for the skis and uh, the short cases and the widespread. What is erythema gyroid and repens? The widespread serpiginous polycyclic and pruriginous. Pruriginous is itchy. Erythema, which is discramic. You can see the skin is peeling around the edges and they are fast growing. So if you go tomorrow and see that they have grown. So it says it's about one centimeter a day and producing concentric figures that uh, resembles a wood grain surface. So hands or feet usually spared and other manifestations include palmar plantar keratosis and ichthyosis. So you can see the wood grain appearance and the, uh, the gyrated erythema. So associated malignancies, malignant neoplasia found in 82%, that's a very high percentage patient with erythema gyratum repens and lung cancer is the most common. It could be associated with uh, CA esophagus and breast as well. So other malignancies, CA colon, stomach, bladder, prostate, uterine, rectal, those are also associated, but very rarely it could be associated with the non-neoplastic conditions like TB, pregnancy, Shrogan's, and Crest syndrome. So this is something that our registrar is very fascinated about, but very rarely we see. Acrokeratosis paraneoplastica, we call it Basic syndrome. So Basic syndrome is having another strong association with the, uh, with the mal underlying malignancy. So what do you call, when, you, when do you call a Basic syndrome? When they have the ac acro means acral size, you have head and neck and the arms and distals. Uh, the cell extremity. So acrokeratosis means keratosis means there is keratosis uh, in the, those areas. So erythematous lesions with the psoriasiform aspect, the uh, psoriasiform aspect uh, that manifests as symmetrical erythematous violation scaly patches on the bridge of the nose because these are very uncommon sight to say the keratosis nose helix of the ears and distal ends of the extremities are initiated found. So if you patient uh, find a patient, especially keratosis of the lips, keratosis of the nose, uh, keratosis of your ears, think of this basic syndrome. So as the disease progress, the exclamation affects the dorsal and palmar plantar regions, produce a violaceous keratoderma. In other skin, this violaceous, violaceous color is not so obvious. And the nails can be affected with hyperkeratosis, onycholysis, and dystrophy. So uh, eventually, additional areas, the other areas like knees, legs, arms, calves uh, can be affected. So what is the association? Squamous cell carcinoma of the upper respiratory or gastrointestinal tract, especially when uh, there are metastases in the cervical lymph nodes. It says that uh, when you perceive a basic uh, patient, it's mainly uh, metastasized to the cervical lymph node. So in my... Um, uh, uh, the training period, I have seen one patient with basic syndrome. She presented with palm plantar keratoderma. So followed that for a few years for the palm plantar keratoderma. And finally, when we saw her, she had this uh, thick keratoderma on her lips. So when the lips get keratoderma, we thought that something is going on, admitted the patient, and even did the full body examination, there was a breast lump. So, so you have to be very vigilant to find out those malignancies. So necrolytic migratory erythema. This is also another, uh, the, the common, not the common one, it's a famous one, often associated with leukogonoma syndrome and consisted with the triad of uh, necrotic migratory erythema, glucose intolerance, and hyperglucogonemia. So initially, it's a pinkish macular papular rash with irregular edges and a standard arcuate or polycyclic pattern. You can see the arches, the half circles or the polycyclic, very cyclic pattern, prominent in areas of the traumas observed, often affecting the knees and intraterrenous areas. Remember, it could be over the areas of knees, so you can neglect it as a trauma. It could be in, in the intraterrenous area. Sometimes there could be the blisters that ruptures easily forming crust while new vesicles continue to develop along the edges. So you have the blisters, you have the you have the rash and some 
they are complicated with candida albicans and staph aureus. So most of the times they are misdiagnosed as the chronic candidiasis because introduced the flexural areas, candida infection. So thinking of candidiasis, they get um, misdiagnosed. So this is another one, acquired hypertrichosis lunugosa. Uh, that is hypertrichosis, is the, the hair, the soft, long, thin, non-pigmented in our uh, skin, it's a lightly pigmented hair that affects the face and ears mainly. It affects, involve the thorax and extremities spreading the, it may involve uh, spreading in the craniocaudal manner. So among women, colorectal cancer is the most frequent and the lung and breast cancer is the other. Uh, they are the other uh, cancers. Men show a great association with lung cancer followed by colorectal cancer. It could be associated with lymphomas, leukemias, and other solid organ tumors. So if you see a patient with a soft, um, fine hair over the face, um, uh, especially female patient and the male patient, soft, fine hair over the face, ears, then think about hypertrichosis lungosa, which has a strong association with malignancy. So these generalized pruritus, this is not uh, the books or the literature, uh, they don't say that generalized pruritus have a strong association with internal malignancy. But what we see in the practice is they have a, a considerable association with underlying malignancy. So generalized itchy may occur in more than 25% of patients with Hodgkin's disease, other hematological diseases like cesarean, mycosis, leukemias can be associated with pruritus. Aquagenic pruritus, especially patients says, when I have a bath, I get itching. So this aquagenic pruritus may be associated with polycythemia as well as lymphoporiparative disorders. Many visceral carcinomas can cause pruritus, including breast GI cancers and carcinoid syndrome. So when a patient comes in to us with a generalized pruritus, if especially if this patient is having the loss of weight, loss of appetite, sudden onset pruritus, not responding to uh, treatment, you have to think of whether it is something causing insight. It could be a systemic disease, liver, renal, or hematological, or it could be a paraneoplastic manifestation. So this is another uh, patient I saw when I was a senior registrar. So this was at NHSL. This patient uh, presented to us with itching and the skin lesions. Uh, and it has been going uh, for like three to four years. And finally, she, he ended up in the national hospital. So there wasn't anything to diagnose for us because when we checked for the lymph node, there were huge cervical and uh, other areas, axillary, and everywhere there was lymphadenopathy. So this patient has chronic itching and this because of this chronic itching that he has had, uh, he has got this uh, nodular prurigo, like pru uh, the itchy nodules, we call it nodular prurigo like lesion. It was all over his uh, um, body, especially over the arms and legs where he itches more. So when we did the bio uh, the chest x-ray you can see the uh, the lymphadenopathy and he was diagnosed have uh, my uh, the Hodgkin's lymphoma so the take-home message if a patient comes the thorough examination is a must especially in a patient like this so acquired ichthyosis is also something like that we are sudden onset of ichthyosis similar to the pattern of ichthyosis vulgaris in adult life uh, they don't say that it's a strong association, but because patients with ichthyosis present to us, we always think whether this could be acquired ichthyosis and whether it could be a malignancy related. So acquired ichthyosis can be a paranoid plastic manifestations. The strongest association with Hodgkin's disease. If a young patient or an elderly patient comes with the, all of a sudden, they present with the ichthyosis. They never had ichthyosis vulgaris or childhood uh, ichthyosis, that is dry skin, dry keratotic skin, but all of a sudden they get it think of other there's some endocrine causes as well but think of whether think whether it could be a paraneoplastic manifestations so um, those are the ones that i'm going to uh, i'm going to the end of the lecture so but i would like to show you these uh, cases there could be many skin disorders associated with underlying malignancy. So this is interesting. This patient will be presented with purpura, uh, the, the large tongue, hemorrhagic papules, and this is amyloidosis. So this is associated with the multiple myeloma, um, uh, the, uh, the light chain, the, the positive uh, uh, the proteins in the uh, uh, blood and the multiple myeloma associated with AL amyloidosis. Free light, uh, high 
free, he was found to have serum free light chain assay uh, with the abnormal kappa and lambda ratio supporting the diagnosis of primary, uh, sorry, this patient had the primary systemic amyloidosis uh, uh, in his uh, diagnosis. So this patient is another interesting patient. Um, this patient was actually, he was sent to us. Uh, he was being diagnosed as anemia and um, uh, he was uh, investigated for anemia. And the HO, the smart HO who examined him, thought of uh, thought that his skin is thickened. So they thought of correctly systemic sclerosis. So he was sent to us uh, to the diagnosis of systemic sclerosis. But we were very happy, happy to see that she could uh, diagnose the uh, skin thickening. But when we examined him, that there were no features to suggest systemic sclerosis except the thickening of the skin. You can see that he, there's some, for his age, there's wrinkling is uh, minimum and he couldn't open his mouth. So this was, uh, and his... Um, uh, the ANA was negative, all the connective, uh, immune, uh, connective tissue uh, investigations were negative, but uh, when we did the biopsy and when we correctly thought of scleridema, scleridema is not scleroderma. Scleridema is a uh, generalized mucinosis of your body when associated with underlying malignancies, mainly hematological, uh, usually multiple myeloma. So he had multiple myeloma, which presented as a scleridema, which is a type of mucinosis. So recognition of a major cutaneous paraneoplastic syndrome allows the doctor to establish an early diagnosis and treatment, which could lead to higher chance of cure and better prognosis for the patient. So if you think a patient presenting with a uh, sudden onset, a very severe skin disease, and uh, the patient is having other B symptoms and loss of weight, loss of appetite, then you have to think of a paraneoplastic manifestation. So thank you. Thank you, Madam. Uh, the final speaker for today is Dr. Sachitra Samarakko, uh, Registrar in Dermatology from the National Hospital, Kandy. Over to you, Dr. Sachitra. If I can disturb you for one minute. Um, if the uh, participants who are joining online have any questions, please put them in the chat or we will be opening that you can uh, unmute yourselves and ask any questions at the end of the um, session too. Uh, we did have one comment requesting for uh, some of the differential diagnosis, I believe from Dr. Chiranjaya's uh, lecture and uh, we will show this slide again, I hope. Uh, that should be possible at the end of uh, all the presentations. Uh, please send in any questions uh, you have for yeah. our speakers on the chat. Thank you. Over to you, uh, Dr. Sachitra. Thank you. Thank you, Sri Lanka Medical College Medical Association, for giving me this uh, valuable opportunity. Uh, I'll be discussing um, 14 MCQs and uh, seven picture based questions. So, my first MCQ is. Regarding psoriasis, uh, it is uh, worsened by lithium carbonate. Uh, second one, uh, pustular psoriasis is associated with hypercalcemia. Third one, metabolic syndrome is associated with psoriasis. Uh, fourth one, nails are commonly involved in psoriatic arthritis. Fifth one, distal interphalangeal joint involvement is the most common manifestation of psoriatic arthritis. Phalangeal joint involvement is the characteristic uh, manifestation of psoriatic arthritis. But the commonest one is
this is very well in Rome with underlying lymphomas and uh, leprosy is also true. Uh, clofacemin therapy is true. Uh, sarcoidosis is true. Ichthyosis vulgaris is false. So when we encounter a patient with acquired ichthyosis, um, we should clearly clarify the onset of ichthyosis. Sometimes that the ichthyosis has been there since the birth. So we have to know whether it is later acquired or uh, it was there since the birth. In leprosy, the presenting manifestation may be only the ichthyosis uh, and also the clopazamine, which is uh, included in the multidrug treatment regime of leprosy is a well-known drug treatment for acquired ichthyosis. And um, uh, as I mentioned about, it, it can present as a paraleoplastic syndrome with associated underlying cancer. So the third one, dermatological manifestations associated with diabetes mellitus include uh, diffuse granuloma annulare, uh, erythema nodosum, atrophic brown macules on shins, uh, necrobiosis lipoidica, and eruptive xanthomas. The answers are uh, diffuse granuloma annulare is true, uh, but uh, the localized granuloma annulare is not associated with diabetes, but the diffuse variant is very well associated with diabetes. And uh, the erythema nodosum is false. The atrophic brown macules on the shin is true. That is a diabetic dermopathy, uh, which is the pathognomonic uh, cutaneous manifestation of a diabetic patient. And uh, the necrobiasis lipidica is also true. And eruptive symptoma is also true. Uh, this picture illustrates you the atrophic uh, hyperpigmented macules of a diabetic dermopathy. And uh, this is another manifestation of diabetes, uh, diabetic bullet. Uh, this occurs as a tense bullet located in the dependent area uh, without any evidence of inflammation. So the fourth question, which of these are true regarding leprosy? Uh, anhydrosis is a feature found in leprosy lesions. Uh, leprosy is known to occur without visible skin lesions. Hypopigmented patches are also always anesthetic. Uh, erythema nodosum leprosum is associated with fever, malaise, and joint pain. Symmetrical sensory neuropathy is a known presentation. The answers are anhydrosis or reduced fetting is a feature found in leprosy lesions. That is true. Um, leprosy is known to occur without visible skin lesion. That is true. In pure neural leprosy, we don't see any cutaneous manifestation, uh, there will be only nerve involvement. The hypopigmented patches are always anesthetic. That is false. Uh, in lepromatous leprosy, towards the lepromatous leprosy fall, fall you will get uh, papules, nodule plaques, and hypopigmented patches. But in the lepromatous leprosy fall, the hypopigmented patches are not anesthetic. And also, the hypopigmented patches uh, encounter in the tuberculoid leprosy, which are located in the face, are also not anesthetic due to the rich nerve supply to the face. Uh, the fourth one, erythema nodosum leprosum, is associated with fever, malaise, and joint pain. That's, that is true. Uh, erythema nodosum leprosum is a type 2 lepra reaction uh, mediated by type 3 hypersensitivity reaction. Uh, it is associated with systemic symptoms. And uh, the symmetrical sensory neuropathy is a known presentation. That is true. It is uh, the uh, lep lepromatous leprosy fall. The patient will have symmetrical sensory polyneuropathy. Uh, this picture illustrates uh, multiple eryth well-defined erythematous copper-color copper plaques uh, distributed asymmetrically, mainly over trunk and posterior trunk and uh, bilateral upper limbs, uh, which indicate borderline tuberculoid leprosy. And uh, this picture illustrates multiple skin-colored papules and nodules located in face, uh, indicating the histoid leprosy variant, which is a very contagious, very infectious one, and very resistant to treatment. And um, there will be high bacillary 
index within the lesion. And uh, this, uh, the other picture illustrates the erythema nodosum leprosum type 2 reaction. Uh, these are the hypopigmented patches of tuberculoid leprosy. Number five, recognize causes of diffuse hair loss. Uh, systemic lupus erythematosus, uh, HIV, hypothyroidism, postpartum, heparin. The answers are systemic lupus erythematosus is associated with diffuse hair loss. Yes, it is true. And also if it is associated with uh, di discoid lupus erythematosus, there will be scarring alopecia. Uh, HIV severe infection can cause uh, diffuse hair loss. And in hypothyroidism, there will be diffuse hair loss. And uh, postpartum period also, you will get uh, um, increasement of hair shedding. And uh, the heparin is a well-known drug for diffuse hair loss. The other drugs uh, encounter are uh, warfarin and acetretin. Uh, number six, uh, acanthosis nigricans is associated with um, nicotinamide therapy, acromegaly, insulin resistance, GI malignancy, autosomal dominant familial variant. The answers are uh, nicotinamide therapy is true, acromegaly is true, insulin resistance is true, and um, GI malignancy is true. Autosomal dominant familial variant is also true. Uh, these pictures illustrate uh, acanthosis nigricans. And you can see the velvety hyperpigmentation of the intratriginous and flexural areas, the soften uh, extensive surfaces. This is associated with, uh, as I mentioned previously, insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome. And um, as our madam, madam discussed previously, it also associated with malignancy, mainly GI malignancies. Uh, when associated with uh, malignancies, there will be predominant mucosal and acral involvement. Um, question number seven, dermatological manifestations of nutritional deficiencies. Vitamin C, uh, follicular hyperkeratosis. Uh, vitamin B12, hyperpigmentation of palms and soles. Uh, zinc deficiency, castle collar or castle necklace, uh, vitamin A, phrynoderma, biotin, seborrheic dermatitis. Here are the answers. Vitamin C, yes, follicular hyperkeratosis is true. There will be uh, perifollicular hemorrhages, uh, petechiae and uh, corkscrew-like hairs and uh, gin, um, bleeding gums. And in vitamin B12 deficiency, hyperpigmentation of palms and soles can be seen. That is true. And uh, they can also have angular stomatitis and glossitis. In zinc deficiency, castle collar, castle necklace, it is not associated. It is false. Uh, castle necklace appearance is associated with pellagra in vitamin B3 deficiency. In zinc deficiency, mainly you will get psoriasiform dermatitis like lesions or periorificial areas. And they can have also alopecia and diarrheas. And uh, in vitamin A deficiency, uh, phrynoderma is true. There's follicular papules with a central keratin plug, uh, mainly di distributed over extensive surfaces. Uh, biotin deficiency or vitamin B7 deficiency uh, associated with seborrheic dermatitis, that is true. Also, uh, these patients will have uh, uh, diffuse hair loss also. Number eight, uh, causes of generalized pruritus include uh, chronic renal failure, lymphoma, uh, polycythemia rubra vera, leprosy, iron deficiency anemia. Uh, the answers are chronic renal failure is true. Uh, the mechanism is not well studied, but associated hyperparathyroidism and uh, dry skin can precipitate uh, generalized pruritus. Uh, lymphoma is also associated with generalized pruritus uh, as a paraneoplastic manifestation. Uh, also, polycythemia rubra vera is associated with aquagenic pruritus. 
the pleurite is worsened after a contact with uh, water. Lepre leprosy is not associated with uh, generalized pleuritis. Uh, and iron deficiency anemia is also associated with generalized pleuritis. Uh, number nine, viruses with oncogenic potential include hepatitis B, HPV type 16, EB, EB virus, human T cell lymphotrophic virus, human herpes virus. Answers are hepatitis B is associated with hepatocellular carcinoma. HPV type 16 is associated, 16 and 18 associated with uh, cervical cancers. And EBV virus is associated with Burkitt lymphoma and Hodgkin lymphoma. And human T cell lymphotrophic viruses uh, associated with uh, adults on onset uh, T cell leukemia. And herpes, human herpes virus, eight is as associated with Kaposi sarcoma. Number 10, causes for generalized hyperpigmentation. Hemochromatosis, Addison's disease, hyperthyroidism, hypothyroidism, poems. The answer is uh, hemochromatosis is true. Uh, the mechanisms are uh, increased melanin synthesis as well as uh, cutaneous deposition of hemosiderine. And Addison's disease uh, also present with hyperpigmentation. Hyperthyroidism is associated with hyperpigmentation, but not hypothyroidism. Poems, which stands for polyneuropathy, organomegaly, endocrinopathy, monoclonal gammopathy, and skin changes. So in skin changes associated with poems are hyperpigmentation, uh, which is seen around 50% uh, of patients, and um, skin thickening or sclerosis. Uh, number 11, skin manifestations of mycobacterial infection include lupus vulgaris, uh, fish tank granuloma, granuloma annulare, scrofuloderma, erythema induratum. The answers are lupus vulgaris is true, uh, fish tank granuloma is true, lupus vulgaris is a granulomatous inflammation of the cutaneous skin. Fish tank granuloma is true. It's caused by atypical mycobacteria, mycobacteria marina. And granuloma annulare is false. Uh, scrofuloderma is a discharge in sinuses, overlying joint or lymph nodes. It is also caused by mycobacterial tuberculosis. And uh, the erythema induratum is also true. It is erythema nodosum like lesions over posterior aspects of lower limbs. Dermatological manifestations of internal malignancies. Uh, number one, acquired pharmaplantar keratoderma, acquired ichthyosis, necrolytic migratory erythema, switch syndrome, Bessex syndrome. The answers is, uh, yes, uh, acquired pharmaplantar keratoderma is associated Acquired ichthyosis is, is also associated. Uh, the necrolytic migratory erythema is also associated with glucagonoma. And uh, Switch syndrome is associated with uh, underlying hematological malignancies. And uh, Bessex syndrome, also true, it is associated with uh, squamous cell carcinoma of upper respiratory tract or upper GI. Number 13, uh, recognized causes of erythroderma in adults include psoriasis, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, atopic dermatitis, seborrheic dermatitis, retroviral infection. The answers are psoriasis is true, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma is true, atopic dermatitis is true, seborrheic dermatitis is true, retroviral infection is true. So what is exfoliative dermatitis? It's the erythema and scaling dermatitis which involves more than 90% of the cutaneous surface. Uh, often obscure the primary lesions that are important clues to understand the evolution of the disease. 
Number 14, the last MCQ, causes for pyoderma gangrenosum include tuberous sclerosis, IgA paraproteinemia, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, rheumatoid arthritis. These are the answers. Tuberous sclerosis is false. IgA paraproteinemia is true. Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, rheumatoid arthritis are true. So these uh, pictures illustrate the pyoderma gangrenosum, uh, which is a painful ulcer with the necrotic undermined violaceous border. The base may be parulent, uh, mainly occur over lower extremities. Mucous membrane and peristomal sites are involved. Uh, associations are inflammatory bowel disease, monoclonal gammopathy, rheumatoid arthritis, hematological malignancy such as acute myelogenous leukemia, and myelodysplasia. So the first picture-based question, what is the diagnosis? So this is a discoid lupus erythematosus disseminated variant. These are well-defined annular plaque with uh, central scarring and hypopigmentation with peripheral hyperpigmentation. Uh, also, there will be central follicular plugging. The long-standing lesions are at a high risk of developing squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, DLE lesions can develop in mucosa also. And uh, in disseminated disease, there will be 10 to 20% uh, risk of developing uh, into systemic lupus erythematosus. Uh, the second picture question, what is the diagnosis? So this is flagellate erythema, uh, linear erythematous streaks with hyperpigmentation, uh, which is encountered in dermatomyositis, adult onset steels disease, leomycin therapy, shiitake mushroom poisoning. The third one. The diagnosis. This is a granuloma annulare. These appear as skin colored papules arranged in the an annular pattern without any evidence of epidermal changes. Uh, common inflammatory skin condition due to a delayed hypersensitivity reaction to a component of the dermis. And uh, this is associated with autoimmune thyroiditis diabetes mellitus, hyperlipidemia, rarely with lymphoma, HIV infection, and solid tumors. Fourth one, the diagnosis. So this is primary systemic amyloidosis. You can appreciate the pinch purpura with raccoon eye sign and also the macroglossia of this patient. And... Uh, the periorbital purpura with raccoon eye sign may be precipitated by coughing while salva manure as well as after pinching or rubbing the skin. Uh, the skin infiltration by amyloid present as waxy, translucent or purpuric papules. Uh, skin involvement seen in 25% of individuals with primary systemic amyloidosis. And um, as I mentioned, Previously, it is associated with macroglossia. Diffuse uh, cutaneous infiltration resulted in infiltrated sclerodermite appearance with associated alopecia. Also, there will be nail dystrophy with thinning and bridging. Uh, this is associated with uh, plasma cell dyscrasias, multiple myeloma. Uh, they can have renal involvement, cardiac involvement, autonomic and sensory neuropathies. Fifth one, what is the diagnosis? This is sweet syndrome. Uh, there are well-defined tender juicy plaques with, that are also occasionally bullous, associated with infection, acute myelogenous leukemia, inflammatory bowel disease, autoimmune disorders, drugs, and pregnancy. Uh, number six, 18-year-old uh, girl with epilepsy started carbamazepine two weeks back. What is the diagnosis? So this is SJS or Steven Johnson syndrome. Uh, always 
this is drug related usually occur 7 to 21 days after the initiation of treatment and uh, there will be 10 percent of epidermal detachment with uh, two or more mucosal membrane involvement most incriminated drugs are allopurinol, NSA, antibiotics, and aromatic anticonvulsants. The last question, a 38-year-old male presented with asymptomatic skin ulcer. So this is a cutaneous Leishman ISIS. This comes to end, my, end of my presentation. Uh, thank you so much. I think a, a special request came from the audience. I think uh, they have asked us to that discuss regarding that uh, courses for uh, blisters in adults. Uh, sorry from the because apologies uh, to the audience because that I due to the time factor I skipped those slides uh, if, the, if our moderator is allowing me to continue this I can finish it within three minutes is that all right yes yes that's fine please go ahead thank you okay so uh what I discussed was that uh, paraneoplastic associated blisters. Uh, I told that paraneoplastic pemphigus and bullous pemphigoid can be associated with internal malignancy. Mostly that pemphigus vulgaris is, the, sorry, pem paraneoplastic pemphigus is the one uh, which is very common with internal malignancies uh, in the view of that blistering disorders. Uh, actually, previously there was a controversy regarding that bullous pemphigoid and uh, association with internal malignancies, but there are now there are that proving evidence with uh, uh, reports that uh, it is uh, basically associated with internal hematological malignancies. So uh, I'll go through the, this list, of, which is apart from the paraneoplastic, I will just to describe how to identify those blistering disorders uh, in adults. So bullous pemphigoid, I mentioned previously, it is mainly appeared in uh, adults, which is itchy and, uh, and also mainly located in the truncal area. And uh, there are that mainly tense blisters are there. And in pemphigus, these are flaccid, fragile blisters are there. And uh, mostly it appears in the, uh, the middle adulthood, not in the that elderly age and he's not uh, basically uh, itchy but it is painful and also mucous membrane involvement also there and uh, it, the, the positivity of Nicole's sign also a uh, significant feature in pemphic uh, diagnosing of pemphigus vulgaris. Uh, uh, there are other variants of pemphigus such as pemphigus fallacious these things. So uh, I just men, uh, mentioned that pemphigus vulgar is only because it is the commonest one. And uh, dermatitis herpetiformis, you know that it is uh, the one with grouped vesicles and uh, with uh, which are basically distributed over the extensions of the limbs. Uh, there is another one thing that dermatitis herpetiformis that it can be associated with uh, celiac uh, disease as well. Uh, um, so uh, then uh, herpes zoster, it's a uh, venomita shingles. It also again a uh, group vesicle, which are painful uh, and uh, which showing that uh, dermatomal distribution again, and also burning, itching, and tingling sensation may be there. And due to any contact uh, associated dermatitis can be uh, present with blisters, vesicles. Okay, that uh, anything it can happen when. Mainly when it is, uh, you know, there are two types of uh, contact dermatitis. One is that uh, allergic contact dermatitis and the uh, irritant contact dermatitis. Mainly in irritant type that we can appreciate that uh, contact dermatitis. In these days, the rainy days, you know that uh, small, small insects are more common, especially that uh, there is an entity called as blister beetle dermatitis. Uh, it, it is very common in that hill country area. So sometimes we have seen that blisters associated in a linear way with uh, erythematous angry looking lesions. This is a blister beetle contact dermatitis again uh, can come up with those blisters. 
uh, again, that epidermolysis bullosa. There are two types: epidermolysis acquired and uh, epidermolysis bullosa acquisita. Uh, so, in acquisita is the one that we have to consider in adult population. These are flax uh, flaxseed blisters, and uh, it mainly appear with associated to minor trauma or friction. And uh, so, in the distal area, is the more uh, common area that we can see because these are the more prone areas to getting uh, minor injuries. Uh, these are again that uh, type of blisters we can see in adult population. Porphyria cutinea tarda is the one uh, uh, with there are classical features that blisters bully uh, mainly expose the sun exposed areas and it can be associated with uh, amelia as well as scarring and also that increased uh, growing of hair. Also, one feature in that porphyria cutinea tarda. Stephen Johnson and toxic epidermal necrolysis actually it's a spectrum. Uh, again, that it, uh, there are necrotic lesions and uh, blisters also visible. And again, it uh, positive that nicotinicide is there. And the mucosal membrane involvement is the classical feature here. That angry-looking lesions that with other mucosal in, uh, involvement, including genitalia as well as uh, ophthalmic mucosa. Other one is the bullous sympatico. It, uh, it can uh, appear in adults, but basically it's a uh, pediatric disorder. But uh, anyway, it is uh, we can there are uh, we have seen in our patients uh, with the bullous pemphigoid in adults population. Uh, it's due to staphylococcal uh, uh, aureus infection. Uh, can be appear in any side of the body. Linear IJ dermatosis again a disorder that. Uh, it's a linear group of vesicles and bullae are there. Uh, that is a one which uh, classical formation of string of pearls appearance uh, or a rosette formation uh, is the uh, because that uh, you, uh, in a distribution of a ring form that uh, multiple business arrangement we can appreciate there. The others are erythema multiforme. I think that uh, most of the registrars and other SRC medical field, they have seen enough patients with erythema multiforme. It is that much uh, common disorder. And target lesion is the classical thing. There are three zones we can appreciate, but there are atypical uh, erythema multiforme, which are accompanied with only two zones. Uh, it can appear anywhere, else, anywhere of the body. Uh, and there are multiple causes uh, which are associated with Erythema multiforme, including drugs, including uh, these two, uh, other diseases, systemic disorders, and uh, internal malignancy. Yeah, uh, one important thing that erythema multiforme really can be associated with internal malignancy as well. Uh, a fixed drug eruption is uh, again a uh, drug cutaneous, uh, cutaneous involvement of a drug reaction and solitary and multiple uh, well demarcated brown dusky red brownish patches can be uh, appear that the red dusky color is the classical color we have to we can appreciate there and sometimes it can be appeared with uh, varying size blisters as well uh, diabetic bullet uh, it's very sometimes common condition in the medical wards uh, spontaneous painless blisters that are beyond hands feet and lower legs is the uh, common scenario uh, and the other thing is the pressure blisters uh, blisters that are formed due to sustained pressure over in uh, bedridden patients uh, we have seen that in uh, when you are practicing in that uh, icu setup uh, most of the time in the the pressure sustained areas that you can Sometimes you can see these type of pressure blisters. The, uh, again, uh, that insect uh, bite reactions is another thing, very common thing. Uh, very easily we can recognize the, that they are giving the history of some insect bite. Uh, there, there may be some bullet formation as well. Uh, the other one is friction blisters. Again, the type of pressure blister, clear fluid blisters that develop due to repetitive friction or burning uh, rubbing. Uh, often on the palms, fingers, so also elsewhere of the body. And thermal blisters due to the thermal injuries. Again, that there's no such characteristic definition of the appearance of the lesions. Uh, it depends on the where that the thermal injury has happened. Uh, uh, there are 17 cases I mentioned here. Apart from that, I would like to mention the, uh, uh, I think uh, my madam also will like with me, that uh, sweet syndrome sometimes can be associated with uh, blisters. And I mean that your point of view, uh, these are the disorders and the medical field that sweet syndrome commonly associated with the medical disorders, sweet syndrome, 
uh, real can be associated when it is involved in that uh, i mean that underlying etiology uh, is some uh, hematological disorder mainly it appears with some blister formation in sweet syndrome and again uh, vasculitis uh, that cutaneous vasculitis also can be associated sometimes associated with uh, blister formation uh, actually that list is extensive but i here i have only mentioned few important uh, common causes for uh, adulthood blistering disorder. Thank you. Is there anything uh, to, clarify, to be clarified? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kiranjan. We have about two minutes more. If there are any questions uh, from the audience or... Uh, yes. So one question uh, this is regarding the management of photosensitive rashes. How are you selecting applications, external applications, necessarily in the SPF factor? Yes, sir. Uh, so basically, sir, that uh, in dermatology practice that uh, we are press, we are asking to uh, give the SPF factor more than 30 plus, sir. There's no, uh, I mean, that exact SPF mark is not that we are not advising to use that SPF 50. There are in the market, we can see that SPF 50, 70, 100 like uh, SPF factor varieties are there. But usually we are asking to use that SPF uh, 30 plus SPF value containing sunscreen. The, the most important thing, sir, uh, not the value, actually that uh, by using other measures, actually that the print hats and uh, low limb clothes uh, and umbrellas, we are the, most of the people not using those things. That firstly, we have to advise on that, the uh, using that protective measures. And uh, secondly, yes, that sunscreen that we have to add, apply correctly with the proper amounts and uh, frequent application also we have to advise them properly because that they are just applying them and neglect and they are going elsewhere and they are thinking that it is all right that now they can expose enough to the sun. That is not the way. Uh, the, the amount and frequent application we have to uh, we have to encourage them, sir. So, as you asked in the SPF value, SPF value of 50 plus, sorry, 30 plus uh, is all right uh, in our condition. I mean, uh, our Sri Lankan population, sir. Thank you. So, I would like to add that we advise the patient's voices. And uh, I would like to add another point, sir. Should you advise the patient to apply sunscreen 20 minutes before uh, leaving the house or getting exposed to the sun? And if the patient is uh, exposed to sun throughout the day, every four hours they have to apply the sunscreen. That's the frequency. 20 minutes before leaving the house or uh, exposed to sun, and every four hours uh, they're continuously exposed to sun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, since we have uh, reached uh, uh, time to conclude, uh, we will be concluding this meeting and uh, the next monthly clinical meeting of the Sri Lanka Medical Association will be held on 11th June uh, in collaboration with the Sri Lanka College of Anesthetics. Um, with that note, and we especially would like to thank the Sri Lanka College of Dermatologists um, for collaborating with us on this occasion. And I would like to invite uh, Secretary SLMA, Dr. Lahiru Konituapu, uh, to hand out a note of appreciation uh, since our other speakers are joining on right. will only be to uh, Dr. Nithya Gunavardhana, uh, Senior Registrar in Dermatology from the National Hospital, Shai. Um, so, with that note, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to our speakers, Dr. Bulini Vienagam, Dr. Shiran Jayakanayate, Dr. Nikhil Bhumavardhan, and Dr. Sachitra Samarapur uh, for the overview of paraneoplastic cutaneous manifestation. We thank all our listeners who have joined online, and thanks you to all of you who have joined this person. Uh, see you next month. Thank you. Thank you.